We're going to continue our study on being, yes, youth, you can go, being stewards. So let's look at our first scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 and verse 7. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So every steward must be found faithful. And faithfulness is an issue of the heart. Verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what have you that you did not receive? Now if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? Every gift, every talent, every ability that we have is a gift from our Heavenly Father. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to get it. And some of us might think, well, I had that before I got born again. I could do that. I could play the piano, whatever. I'm sure Carolyn maybe could play the piano before she got born again. Whatever it might be, you might have been good in math before you were born again, going towards whatever calling God had. He formed you in your mother's womb and placed these gifts and callings in you. So it's not like you suddenly got it yourself. It is a gift from God. And yes, as we're wise, as Carolyn practiced the piano and grew in the gift that God had for her, we do that, but it still is always a gift from God. We didn't earn it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter 4. As every man has received the gift, here it's talking about receiving the gift, the gift, what God's given us, it's been put in us. Even so, minister the same one to another. So our gift isn't just for ourselves. It's to minister one to another. What good would it do, and I'm using Carolyn as an example I did last week, but what good would it do if she's got this gift of music and all she does is goes in a room, has all the windows closed, the doors locked, and plays, just plays for nobody but herself. She wouldn't be ministering that gift to anyone else. That gift would stagnate. So minister whatever gift you've received. Minister the same one to another as what? Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And we looked at that. And everyone has been bestowed with grace-given gifts. They're inside you. And every one of us, without exception, has received something has received a grace gift. So we saw to begin the study that we are to be stewards of the gifts that God has put in us. Then we looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 9. And I'm not going to read that right now. We'll go past that. But it lists the various ministry gifts to serve in the body of Christ. Ministry of helps, ministry of giving, etc. And we'll look at those all another time when we probably summarize everything that we've learned on stewards. We saw that Adam and Eve were supposed to be stewards in the earth, and God gave them everything they needed to be good stewards. Gave them dominion and authority. Gave them seed. God always gives whatever it is we need to be stewards. Adam and Eve fell because they listened to Satan and lost sight of their position. Never lose sight of what God's called you to do. Never lose sight of the fact that God has put grace gifts in you, that you are gifted and have something to serve the body of Christ. Then we looked at stewards of the kingdom of God, generational stewards. We saw that Joshua taught the people, taught his family and the people after him. But then we saw in Judges chapter 2 that the next generation did not know the Lord. They weren't taught. And the company of Israel went the way of Balaam. 
so today, well, we, a steward is a household distributor, a manager, an overseer, a preacher of the gospel. You might say, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor. It doesn't say a pastor, it says a preacher. A preacher is an explainer, an encourager. It says that we are to be able to give to any man that asks the reason for our hope. We're to be able to share Jesus and what he's done, share the mystery of the kingdom with everybody. But the requirement of a steward, again, is to be found faithful. We won't flourish if we're selfish, self-centered, where it's all about me. And we talked about next generation and children, and I'm so thankful for the ladies that are going to put on this tea so we can, they can impart to the next generation of ladies the importance and the place God has for every woman in, in the kingdom, that they're not an afterthought. So then we looked at the reason God chose Abraham was because he would teach his family and his household. And his household we saw is the extension. And we looked at and saw that our household is the body of Christ. And we're to, first of all, our children, and then we to, are to minister to and look after the body of Christ. We don't step over somebody in need in the body of Christ and leave them laying there in need and go minister to someone over in the world. Because... They will know us by our love. And if we don't have that love amongst ourselves, where we help and lift one another up, why would the rest of the world want what we have? So we first, our children, then our household, the body of Christ, and once we have that, we go f out from there. And so we saw that, we looked at that all last week. I'm not going to review that. So now, we started last week, stewards of the mysteries. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Stewards of the mysteries. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in students, stewards, that a man be found faithful. So we're to be stewards of the manifold grace gifts. We saw that. We are to be stewards of the next generation, of our household, and of the household, the body of Christ. And now it says we're to be stewards of the mysteries of God. And stewards of the mysteries of God applies to our household our family, our children, the body of Christ, and beyond. And again, it talks about a steward being faithful. Next verse. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. That's three. I'd like verse two. Did I already read verse two? All right, then. We won't do three because that's going to take a long time to go through, so we won't go there. But the purpose, we have revelation knowledge. The purpose God shows us a mystery is for the purpose of sharing with others. Not to brag, not to let people think you're so smart. And I know Pastor David is. I should be saying that more often because I am younger than him, so maybe I would rise to the top here. <laughs> I just found out how to do that. You see, God wants to give us an understanding and a revelation of our authority. If we don't understand who we are and walk in our authority, and that's a mystery we need a revelation of, we will not be able to understand. We, one of the mysteries is that the kingdom of God is here now. So we, when we say things like, thy kingdom come, we haven't understood the mystery. 
because the kingdom of God is here. Jesus said the kingdom has come. Tell them it's near, and now it's come. The kingdom of God is with each and every born-again believer. And God wants us to know. He wants us to understand the mystery, the reason, the understanding, the revelation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's vitally important. The virgin birth, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In order to become a Christian, in order to become a child of God, we have to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We are the only religion that has a living God. All the others are dead. Buddha, Allah, etc., etc. They're dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. So we have to understand that. You see, we get revelation knowledge and it changes our life. And then we're to take that as a good steward and share it so it will change others' lives. To give an answer for the hope that is in us. But again, we're to be found faithful. Not flawless. And I know I used to, way back, and I would think, well, you'd hear teaching. Well, I guess I can't do that because I'm not good at that, and I missed it here, and I haven't got enough knowledge, so you can't know. What you need to do is be faithful with what you've been given. Nobody other than Jesus is perfect. Now, saying that, my spirit man is perfect. And my soul realm is working on it. It's being renewed. Amen? So we saw that last 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. And we went through that last week, verse by verse, where the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. And we run into problems when we try and figure out what God is saying in our natural thinking and understanding. And it leads us into error. That brings us to religion. And religion always breeds bondage. Religion is trying to do something to get God to accept you. And we may as well stop right there because none of us are in a place where we can do anything good enough to get God to accept us apart from Jesus. It's Jesus. And because of Jesus, we do certain things. So we looked at that. So we can't be governed and try and figure out the scriptures from the natural thinking. And one of the ways it says we speak forth the mysteries of God, he's hidden them for us, not from us. And one of the ways we speak forth mysteries is speaking in other tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it says, I speak mysteries. Speaking in other tongues, you're speaking forth mysteries of God. Every single person, once you get born again, should be filled with Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Speaking in other tongues is not a religion. It's not just for the Pentecostal denomination. It is a Pentecost experience because it happened at Pentecost. But speaking in other tongues is what Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for until ye be endued with power from on high. The ability to walk and have more revelation knowledge is to be able to speak in other tongues. Amen. And one of the ways, you, there's prayers in there, Ephesians, we may get at that another time, but you can pray the prayers in Ephesians 1 and 3. And I remember I first heard this so many years ago from Brother Hagan, and he said before he would preach, as he's studying, he would pray those Ephesian prayers, putting his name in it. And then he'd pray in tongues. And then he'd read scripture. And then he'd ask and believe that the Holy Spirit would give him understanding. I did that. It's amazing how the scriptures open up. Why? Because Holy Spirit's given us revelation knowledge. 
We don't know how to pray these things in our known language because they're a mystery that God has stored up for us. So it is vitally important. If Jesus told the disciples they were already born again, he told them, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, now, before you go out witnessing, before you go out and do anything, stay and be filled with Holy Spirit. It is vitally important. If Jesus said it's important, it's important. And do you know, Jesus was filled with Holy Spirit when he got up out of the waters of baptism. Jesus, it says in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all. If Jesus needed to be anointed with the Holy Spirit, endued with power, baptized in Holy Spirit, he told the disciples they needed it. Why do we think we don't? We do. It's just that simple. And I'm not putting anybody down, but there's been wrong teaching regarding that. And you do not have to wait. You do not have to tarry. You do not have to make yourself good enough. You can. You're good enough the moment you got born again. The moment you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you are now a born-again child of God, and right at that moment you can be filled with Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. It's all about Jesus. It's always all about Jesus. So now let's look at Romans 16, 25. We're going to look at the mystery, stewards of the mysteries. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, his gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation, it's talking again about the mystery. There's a revelation of the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. God kept it secret. It says, and we saw that last week, if Satan had known what would happen when Je- that Jesus would rise from the dead, he thought, just kill Jesus, we're done with this. He did had no idea Jesus would rise from the dead, even though it had been prophesied and prophesied and prophesied. If he had known that you and I would be little anointed ones running around in the earth, he would never have killed Jesus. He played right into God's hand. He played right into God's hand. So there's a mystery. So let's start on the mystery. Colossians 1 verse 26. Colossians 1. Even the mystery. When I started studying this and I'm seeing stewards and so I I googled stewards in the Bible. That was what I put in for Googling. Stewards in the Bible. Stewardship in the Bible. Because I needed all the scriptures pertaining to it. And then I came across mystery. And then I put in scriptures in the word pertaining to mystery. So here, the mystery which had been hidden. And remember, we read that it's been hidden for us, not from us. From ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The mystery is to be made manifest to you and me. It's for us. Um, religion had taught, and I had, in where I grew up, I has not seen, neither ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him. Well, how dumb is it to say God prepared them for me they're hidden from me he doesn't want me to know what they are if he prepared them for me to me he wants me to know what they are they haven't been hidden from us they've been hidden for us to stop Satan to whom God would make known what the riches of the glory When we know this, there's glory involved, and we can just, you could go over to 
Corinthians where it says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Part of the mystery is we have this treasure. We have this glory in our earthen vessel. Hallelujah. It's in our spirit and it's flowing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We have the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Notice it's among the Gentiles. That's important, which is, and here's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was a mystery. It was unheard of. The anointed one and his anointing in you, the hope of glory. The riches of the glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have to change our thinking. Every time we think about something, it's Christ in us, and I'm in Christ. The anointing's in me, and I'm in the anointing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. The name of Jesus. Okay, so we see there the mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither... Now here's part of this mystery. In Christ, one body, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all what? One. Where? In Christ. We're one. We're one body. We saw the various gifts that were stewards of the gifts. We're one. We have different gifts, but we're one body. Doesn't matter. Jew nor Greek. You see, the Jews and Greeks were very separate. The Jews were a separate called people who had the law. But you see, this is talking about in the realm of the in your spirit man. We are spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. When we get born again, God takes out the stony old spirit the fallen spirit that happened when Adam bowed his knee to Satan and puts within us a heart of flesh, a brand new spirit. And in the spirit, in our spirit, there is neither Jew nor Greek. We all have a measure of faith. We all have Jesus. We're one in Jesus. We have to so see ourselves in Christ, in Jesus, and him in us. And then there's no room for bragging. There's no distinction. No one's better than the other one. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female. Now, look. <laughs> We're talking about in the realm of the spirit, not in the natural realm, okay? It makes a big difference in the soul and natural realm, okay? So make sure you understand that. There's no crossover either. There's no changing that. <laughs> but we're talking about this. We have to become spirit-minded, spirit-conscious. Everything you see in the natural came out of the realm of the spirit. Because God's a spirit. And in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. God made everything. So everything that has a physical whatever came out of the realm of the spirit. Man doesn't create. You think somebody... You, we make something and we think we created this. You know, Carolyn does the decoration. She created it. Well, she did, but she didn't create it. She took what God created and made something out of it, designed it. But those flowers, I don't know what they're made of, but they're probably made of earth somewhere or oil. or pl If they're plastic, they're made from oil, which was in the ground, which God made. So everything comes in the, that you see in the physical has come out of the realm of the spirit, and we are to be more spiritually minded than earthly minded. 
So Galatians, next verse, please. We're one in Christ. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now in verse 16, it says, and not to seeds, meaning many, but one, meaning Christ. So when we get born again, we're Christ. And then we're Abraham's seed. And whatever God promised Abraham, we're an heir to because of Jesus, because we're in him. We're the seed of Abraham, not physical, not because we're a Jew, but because it's talking about verse 16. It says, because Jesus, the promise was made to Abraham, seed, singular, not meaning many, meaning referring to Jesus. I am Jesus. I am Christ. I'm in him. Therefore, the promise is mine. It's mine. Whoever's in Christ has the promise given to Abraham. And it says Jesus became a curse so that the blessing of Abraham would be mine. I do not need to be cursed in any area. Because Jesus became that curse for me. Next verse. All right, that's it. So we're heirs according to the promise. There was a distinction that God made that separated the Jew, the Gentile, male, female. But in Christ, they're gone. In Christ, they're gone. Now, the reason God needed the Jews, he needed a man. Abraham wasn't a a Jew, he was a sun worshiper. But he listened to God. God needed a people. The reason for the flood? Because the people were contaminated. There no longer was going to be a pure race of people. They had been contaminated by the angels. So God got rid of them all, save Noah and his children. They were the only ones that that it said righteous Noah, meaning his bloodline was still pure human. It wasn't tainted by angels, etc. So he had to get rid of all the rest before Noah and his sons were contaminated. If his sons had been contaminated, only Noah and his wife would have gone on that ark. The reason he had to do it because he gave his word to Eve that the seed of a woman would deliver us. God had no choice. He gave his word. That's why there was the flood. So he had to get somebody that would believe him and listen to him. So he could have a people. If he did not separate that people and give them all these laws, there would not have been a virgin to bring forth Jesus. So that's why he did it. Don't, everything God does is good. And everything God does is because he is love and he is light. So if you don't understand something and it looks like God's being a monster, stop that thought. God is always good, only good, and everything he does is good all the time. So that's why there was that flood. That's why God had to have this separate people. And God, and I used to wonder about it when I would read it, that God wanted all the animals, children, and all destroyed of these horrible nations. There was a couple nations that he said, no, their cup isn't full yet. They, there was room for repentance. If the Jews walked there and they saw what God was like, there was room for their, them to repent. But I wondered about it until you start reading and researching and finding out what God has to say and let the Bible interpret it. In those heathen nations, there was 
sodomy, homosexuality, those priests to the, the goddess Aphrodite, et cetera, et cetera. She was half man, half woman, et cetera. There was all that kind of worship. They were burning their children, causing their children to go through the fire. They were cohabiting with animals. And the, it was out in public, in the streets. So the children saw it. So what is in the children's imagination to grow up and do? There was no hope. They were totally sold out to Satan. And that's why they had to be destroyed, all of them. Because there were times when God didn't tell them to wipe everybody out where it wasn't that bad. But wherever he said to wipe them all out, that's why. There was no hope for them. And I think it was the, was it the Amorites? God said their cup isn't full yet, meaning there was still room. They hadn't gotten so depraved, there was no hope. We can get, and it says in Romans chapter 1, that man can become so depraved, so reprobate, there's no hope for him. So that's why, that's all the children saw, that's all the children knew. You see, even when Balaam tried to curse, Balak wanted Balaam to curse the children of Israel, he would go up on the mountain, he couldn't curse them. He had to say what God put in his mouth, which was blessing. But he was a heathen. He was reprobate. He wanted the fame and he wanted the glory from Balak and he wanted the money. So when all he was doing is blessing him and not cursing him, Balak got mad and wasn't going to give him the money because you didn't do what I told you to do. He says, I'll tell you what. You cannot curse what God has blessed. Let me tell you, nobody can curse you. Nobody. I don't care if people do voodoo and witchcraft over you, they cannot curse you if you won't receive it. Because you're blessed. Jesus became a curse so you could be blessed and nobody can curse you. So anyway, so what did Balaam tell Balak to do? He said, these Jewish soldiers have been away from their wives for a long time. You get the women of this, of your Moab, the Moabitish women, this was the king, Balak was the king of Moab. You have them strip naked and go dance among the soldiers. Bring them food and have them dance. And when they entice the men, they will get the men to start offering sacrifices to your God. It's amazing what sex can do. I'm glad we're having that teaching. You see, God needed those people. But there came a time when God didn't need the Jews for that purpose and that's where we've been reading in Galatians, one new man. That's a mystery. Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, male, female, bond, slaves, equal in Christ. Because we didn't have to be born a certain way. We didn't work for it. It's because of what Jesus did for us. You see, Jesus didn't have to do any of that for himself. He did it for us. And I want to tell you that covenant is between God and Jesus. And there's nothing you and I can do to stop it. We cannot break that covenant. It's established in Jesus. And because I'm in Jesus, I get all the benefits. I get all the benefits because I'm in Christ. But I have to know the mystery of it. I have to understand what I have, or it won't do me any good. So because of what Jesus did, 
we're beneficiaries of his goodness, of what he has done. You know what? We're going to end there. Well, let's just skip ahead. We'll do that one. Um, okay, let's just, just, I'll do the Ephesians 1. Maybe we'll look at that next week. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 a minute. Ephesians 2, 12. That at that time, it's talking about Gentiles. You are without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, or you could say from being a Jew. So it created a division here. The Jews and the Gentiles, there's a division. And strangers from the covenants of promise. We were strangers from the Abrahamic covenant of promise. We had no hope of ever being able to get in on that covenant and without God. Next verse. But now, that's where we were, but now, in Christ Jesus, I was sometime far off But now because of Jesus, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, I am made nigh to God. I now have a covenant with God. I now have the promises of God because of the blood of Jesus. Not because of anything I have done, but because of the blood. So now there's no distinction. We're one body. We had already saw last week, we're one body. Jews and Greeks, we're all one body. We're all in Christ. We're Jesus' body. Next verse. For he is our peace, and he hath made both one. He made Jews and Gentiles one. You do not need to become a Jew to get in on the promises. You do not have to practice the Jewish laws and rites to get in. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead. You and Jews need to do the same thing, and now you're both one in Christ. And he's broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The law and all of the stuff that separated, and that old covenant, what separated the blood of bulls and goats, etc., that separated the Jews and the Gentiles is gone. This is important because sometimes we swing over thinking now, and back into keeping the law. You see, nobody has to tell you really what to keep because it says he'll give us a new heart and he'll write the laws on our heart. There's some things we just know, just know not to do. And if we listen to that, we just won't do it. So that wall is broken down. We saw where we now are joint heirs. We saw that we have the promise The wall's broken down. Next verse. Did I want to go to another verse? I think so. He's abolished in his flesh, in Jesus' flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments. In Jesus' flesh. How can that be? Well, it says that Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus kept every law. He, so they're abolished. We don't have to follow all the washings. There's what, 300 and some or other laws? For to make in himself, to make in Christ of twain one new man. We are one new man. And actually, in Ephesians, it says he's given us a name. That his name, he's called us by his name. The name of that new man is Jesus. The name of the new man is Jesus. 
The name of the man is Jesus, and he's given one new man, and it's Jesus. You and I are in Christ, in Jesus. And in the realm of the Spirit, that's who we are. We're not Jesus like he's the head, but we're in him. And now I have a place. All those commandments Jesus kept for me. And I know it, in, in, a talk, in Deuteronomy 28, it says, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and be faithful to do all his commandments, then you shall be blessed. It's impossible. It's impossible for you and me to keep all those commandments. But Jesus did, and I'm in him. So God looks at me through the blood of Jesus in Christ and sees me as though I've kept all the commandments. That, that, that's shouting ground. That's exciting. That's just a marvelous thing that he did. He didn't have to do it for himself. He did that for me. So he made peace. What? Peace between God and man. There's no enmity between God and man. Next verse. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God, reconciled, no difference between Jew and Gentile, reconciled both of us in one body, in Jesus' body. When he went to the cross, he took the law, he fulfilled the whole law, he took the curse and made Jew and Gentile one body, having slain the enmity thereby. He got rid of that division. That's who we are. That's a mystery. No one could figure that out. That's a mystery. That's one of the mysteries we're to be a steward of, that we're now one body and that we're in Christ and Jew and Gentile together. And because I'm a Gentile, that's a mystery, that when I receive Jesus, I now am a Christian. I'm now in Christ. The Jews are in Christ. I now am an heir to the province promises of Abraham. That's a mystery. You can't figure that out in your mind. If you could, Satan's not stupid. He would have had it figured out. He couldn't. It was hidden. For us. For us. And that's the mystery we're to be a steward of. It makes so much difference if we would just preach the gospel and not religion. Religion will kill you. There's certain things as a believer we shouldn't do. Not because I'm not going to do them, because I want God to love me more, or I want God to bless me more. It's because I have an enemy, and his name is Satan. And if I get out there doing crazy stuff, if I go out there and start taking drugs, I will reap... Satan's playground of misery. I will fall off of the balance beam or something. It's, I, it's not that I don't take drugs because God won't love me. He loves me in spite of my own stupidity. But I will end up. It says whoever you obey, whoever you listen to, you become their servant. You become their slave. And if I do things that are over in Satan's area, I will become his slave. That's why I don't do it. And I've been given Holy Spirit to help me, empower me not to do it. And Holy Spirit's in me to give me a desire to please my Heavenly Father. And zero desire to do the other stuff. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. So who are you? In a way, in the realm of the Spirit, you're Jesus' body. The body doesn't go by a different name than the head. We are not God. 
but we're children of God. We are not Jesus, but we are joint heirs with Jesus. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and it says we're seated with him in heavenly places. Where is our seat of authority? At the right hand of the Father. We're seated far above principality, power, ruler of the darkness of this age. If I'm seated above and all of this is under my feet, Satan has zero power unless I give it to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 